Myths and realities. Uh, we know the realities. Let's get started with the myths of leaders, Stan. What are they? Well, it, it, it goes back to when I was a kid. Uh, there was a childhood book that my mother had gotten in when she was a child, and then she read to me, and I now read to my granddaughter. And one of the pictures I remember with a little story is Atlas holding up the sky and standing on the mat, top of the mountain, and there's an exchange with Hercules and golden apples. But the basic premise is Atlas holds up the sky. The sky stays there because Atlas is there. And you know, we just kind of accept that. And you think about leaders, you got a CEO, you got a president, you got whatever it is, we just sort of accept that the sky is up there because they're holding it up. And of course, that's preposterous, but we do. And so the reality is, there's, as we took on this book, it was because I'd studied leadership through a lifetime, I'd, I'd learned checklists, I'd, I'd been told if I stood a certain way, talked a certain way, it'd be more effective with troops and things like that. Hmm. But then you find out that never really worked. And you say, well, maybe I'm just not doing it right. And so we went back to Plutarch's Lives. And if you haven't read Plutarch's Lives, get ready. It's a 1,000 pages. I was going to say, I'd rather read your book. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, everybody can say Plutarch, but when you actually read it, it's like Plutarch. <laughs> but, but there was a time about 70 years ago when everybody read it. Theodore Roosevelt said he had read it a 1,000 times. Alexander Hamilton took notes on it when he was in a little cabin at Valley Forge. Oh. So the reality was it was in our, our mind, but it colored the way we think about leaders and helped to reinforce this mythology. And the problem with the mythologies, and we really identified three major myths, is it just causes us to think about leadership wrong. Okay. And that carries a heavy cost. Um, your book is structured around 13 leaders. Some of them are surprising, and I, I just, I want to, I want to, I'm going to pick two of the 13, and I want to start with Robert E. Lee, whom I, whom I was surprised to find out was a hero of yours. So tell everybody first why he was a hero of yours, and then what happened. Sure. In the minds of the military, Robert E. Lee was sort of the perfect soldier. I went to Robert E. Lee High School. I played, you know, sports for the Washington Lee Generals. I went to West Point, and there are all the other generals that have statues and pictures, but Robert E. Lee was special. They were all looked at as humans who were good generals. Robert E. Lee was something higher than that. He was this worthy of emulation. And so he was this figure that everybody said, I'd like to be a great leader. I can never be as good as Robert E. Lee, but I'd like to be in that direction. And I spent my whole life, and as I told Adam before this, my wife, in 1976, not long after we got married, gave me a picture of Robert E. Lee. It was actually a, a fake print. And then they, you know, that, that clear stuff, they paint on top of it and make it look like it's a painting. For 25 bucks, she gave it to me framed. And I kept it my whole life and career. At every set of quarters, we hung it because Robert E. Lee, I wanted to show people that's who I admired. In the summer of 2017, one morning, I went, took it off the wall, took it to the garbage and threw it away. And I would have never done that, except I had gone through this journey where I started to study Lee more, and my wife started to poke me and say, are you sure you want that hanging there? I said, yeah, it's Robert E. Lee. And she goes, he's sending a message now when people walk in your office that you believe in the things that his memory has now been used to propagate, white supremacy and some things which I'm not comfortable with. She says, I think you ought to get rid of it. And we had this ongoing argument for about a month. I tried every one. I said, you gave it to me, honey. I love you. <laughs> and then finally, I realized she was right. At age 63, the same age Robert E. Lee was when he died, I threw his picture away because I realized that the picture wasn't the real man and the image that we have held and used as both perfect and in some cases as negative, neither was real. They were images that we create because of the mythology of how we look at leaders. And so as a consequence, this otherwise extraordinary soldier, we had simplified him. Hmm. We'd actually taken away some of the humanity and the reality. And, and the cost to us is, as long as I was trying to be Robert E. Lee, I could never be 
as good a stem of crystal as I ought to be. Because that's who I have to be. And I think you, you, you know, this, the, the subject of our entire conference is, is reinvention. And I think you just put your finger on it. it th this was about partly reinventing Stan McChrystal, right? Yeah, who desperately needs it. Uh, <laughs> and has a number of times through my career. Uh, when I was a young officer, I figured out what would do to make units work. And it was very centralized, tight control. Mm -hmm. And I did that, and I was rewarded for that. And then, as I got in bigger organizations, I suddenly realized that didn't work. That wasn't ever really right in the first place, but you could get away with it in smaller ones. And so I started loosening up, and then as, as I've recorded about the Joint Special Operations Command, then later, later in my career, the last decade, I ran into this situation where I'm commanding this very elite force that has this storied history that's the equivalent of a Super Bowl champion football team, and suddenly we're out there trying to play basketball against an enemy who's better at that than we are. And we either reinvent ourselves or we lose. And it had to start with me as the leader. I either reinvent myself or we lose. And, and I'm gonna, before we come to this second leader who I'm very eager to talk to you about, as, as, as you know, um, you've been advising corporations for, for a long time now. It, it, Explain how seamlessly you can make that, that argument to them that what they need to do with their corporations, which are having fundamental problems for one reason or another with their leadership, is, is similar to what you did when you had to change the approach in Iraq. Sure. The, the, the first thing people have to do is they start to say, well, the military is different. It's command and control. Right. And I said, it's absolutely the same. You can't order someone to go into harm's way. On the parade ground, you can say go left and right because they're scared of the sergeant, they'll do it. In combat, they're far more scared of the enemy. Mm. And so the reality is you can ask people to do things and they'll do it because you influence them. It's the same as business. It, one wears uniforms and one doesn't and that's it. So when you're trying to get an organization to make the change, you have to understand there's these series of things of why people don't change and why organizations. One, they've probably been successful at what they did there is a fear in the organization that if they change, they will fail. And, and that's an interesting argument. They say, we created this great organization. It's been successful, been profitable. If we change and fail, that would be bad. And then you sort of point out, guess what? You're on the road to failure now if you don't change. And so you start there. And then, then people come back and say, well, what, ab what about me? Mm -hmm. They don't say this out loud, but they think it. Mm -hmm. If the organization changes, it operates differently. I've built up equities and experience and credibility, and you suddenly change it. Is there a place for me? And that's a fair question. It's not a disloyal question. It's a fair question. Mm -hmm. We have the same thing. And then finally, you know, it, it sort of comes down to we're too busy. And it's, that's a fair argument. You say, we, we have to change, we have to reinvent, and you say, we will next quarter. We've got to make our numbers this quarter. They, there won't be anything to reinvent. Yeah. And the problem is, you're so caught in the here and now, almost every organization is, the military the same, that making the decision to change, which carries the risk of looking a bit further, is a daunting prospect. And, and that's where the leader has got to be very conscious of that reality and create the space and time to do that. Now, back on leadership, just sure. as you identified your entire life with, with Robert E. Lee, uh, I think everyone will understand that you also have a, a, a real fondness for the fashion business. And so that must explain why you wrote about Coco Chanel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we included Coco Chanel. And, you know, I'm thinking, really? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I had this little team, we put together to write this book, and you know, we're talking about different people, and, and I'm thinking, you know, Alaric, the Vitizagoth, or something like that, and someone says, Coco Chanel. I didn't even know it was a person. I knew there was, <laughs> I knew there was Chanel number five. <laughs> and, Which is pretty good, by the way. Yeah. That, that, you know, that means that that was the success of, of, of Coco Chanel's business. Well, you you was, knew what Chanel number five was. Well, that's right. <laughs> the thing about Coco Chanel, when you study her, she was hard as woodpecker lips. She, she was amazing. <laughs> you know, here's a story. You know, she's an orphan. She learns to sew. She sings in clubs and starts to get to know some people. And she intersects with opportunity. 
Because right about during the First World War, women are wearing heavy fashions, heavy hats, corsets, and all of this stuff. And they need to be physically liberated. They also are entering the workforce, so they need to wear practical clothing. Also, it's the First World War when the cost of materials is rising. And Coco Chanel sees all this, and she says, OK, let's take advantage and let's push it. And then the other thing that was so fascinating is she made herself the exemplar of what you wanted to be. So the fashion she, that she created, she wore. The way she wanted people to look and act, she looked and act. And so the idea was, I want to be like Coco. And so her fashion, the perfume business followed. And she was a hard businesswoman. I mean, she was she, incredibly hardworking and successful. But she understood that she had to be the you know, walk the walk, talk the talk, whatever we want to say. She had to exemplify everything she wanted people to follow. And so as a leader, she not just directed people, she actually led in the way she created opportunity for other people to do that. Now, um, I want to change gears and, and talk about a couple other things and then let, let these just people pay. do my job for the, for the, rest, of our, for the rest of our time. But uh, you, were, you spent the weekend uh, campaigning for a, a congressional candidate yeah. in Ohio. Tell everybody about that, if you would. Yeah, I, I've never been involved in politics until uh, a couple of years ago I got involved in one race in Boston because there was, a, there was a young guy I'd gotten to know. He happened to be a veteran, and he asked me would I come do it. So I went up and did an event at the Peabody VFW and a couple of things. And he won. And he's Congressman Seth Moulton. And I didn't even ask him what party he was when I agreed to go up and do it. I just knew he was a centrist, reasonable guy. And I said, well, we need, we need those. What party is he? He is a Democrat. Um, then recently, I was contacted by a Navy veteran who's running in a very tight race in Ohio. And they've got very gerrymandered districts. There's all kinds of challenges in the steel area. So I went out Saturday to campaign for him. And same thing, I didn't ask him what party he was. I found out he was a, he's another centrist Democrat. Uh, but what we did was we, we basically are making the argument that there's got to be somebody in the middle. There's got to be somebody who understands that the person who's on the other side, as you learn in warfare, doesn't necessarily have it wrong. I mean, I fought wars against people who, if I just turned aside, I could argue their argument as well as I could argue mine. And so the point is that the other person isn't necessarily evil. And so what we've got to do is we've got to start working back toward the middle. And that starts, I think, with leadership at a very local level in the Congress and the local things. And so I think if I can do anything, if I can encourage young people like that to take the jump and to try to pull people sort of back from either brink, you know, at the, at the ends of the political spectrum, it will be of value. And I think if we don't do it, if we reinforce the, uh, the vitriol, it's going to be hard to get anything done in our country. So you've endorsed, you've supported publicly all of, all of two candidates. Is your phone, your proverbial phone ringing off the hook now for, from other <laughs> veterans in particular to support them? Yeah, you know, it's not, I'm not like that guy Adelson who gives $100 million a shot. <laughs> you know, what I do is I give a day, and I go hang out in the VFW with, with uh -huh. them doing that. But, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's more. If we think about it, maybe if we, each of us here, just take something we believe. It doesn't have to be a candidate. It can be a cause. And we just demonstrate that. And if that is a credible, reasonable thing, maybe that's more powerful. Go ahead. There's a paddle up there. Hi there. I'm Kathleen from Integrate. OK, this is worse than Robert E. Lee. But I read an article recently by Tim Harford in the Financial Times about disruption and Hitler. And basically, he said that the Brits had created a tank in like the early 20th century, that the British Army was unable to wield effectively because their organizational structure hampered their ability to sort of mold to the new technology. And then 20 years, a lot, 20 years goes by, Hitler has the opportunity to enter into something more like a blank slate and be, create the blitzkrieg around the tool and sort of adapt the organization to the potential of the technology. And so I, I just love your comments. Like I read that and I was like, wow, like Hitler, the you know disruptive innovator from 1930, um, which is ridiculous and horrible to say, and yet 
seemingly aligned with what you're describing. So I'm just I'm curious to hear your comments on that from a military history perspective. Yeah, um, you're you're you basically got it right. That gives Hitler more credit than he deserves because there were some military. But the the point is they lost the First World War, so they started with the idea, well, we won't do that again. And so the German army, you know, took a tabula rasa approach, and it, it turned out to be really effective. There was a move to bring back the horse cavalry into the United States military, and it was after World War II. And you sit there and you go, what? Why? Because there is always going to be a constituency for either the status quo or what used to be. Yeah. yeah. Muscle memory. Let's get a mic up here. Oh, we have one back there, please. Uh, hi there, Matt Heimer from Fortune. Uh, I was very moved by what you were saying about the need for uh, leaders who would poll, uh, who would take a back to the middle center view. Is there someone in your book who reflects that uh, kind of centrist uh, unifying force and could you tell us a little more about them? Well, my, my mind is racing, no. Um, we have Boss Tweed in there who took a, you know, what I can make approach. Uh, Margaret Thatcher is fascinating to study because she was not on the spectrum, but she, she hit a tuning fork with the, Ameri with the British people just at a time when they felt as though their decline from, from the Second World War on needed to stop. And so what I learned from many of these leaders, Martin Luther, Martin Luther nails his 95 theses on the church door. The point is he nailed it at exactly the right moment when the people were primed for someone to do that. It wasn't that he was brilliant, he'd been doing it for years. He intersected with fate and then, and then wrote it. So I guess my point there is, it's not always somebody who has this great vision, not always someone who has been at it a long time. Sometimes it's absolute fate that that moment comes and that person arises, whether they even know that they're that person or not, and then what they do with that from there on. And, and are you saying that, that is, that a, is that a commentary on, on Donald Trump as president of the United States, and what do you think of him as a leader? I knew we'd get here. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at the countdown clock, so we yeah. had to get to it sooner rather than yeah. later. Yeah. Um, I think David Brooks said it best when he said, Donald Trump is the wrong answer to the right question. You know, I did spend Saturday at the VFW in Canton, Ohio. And I spent it talking to veterans now in union jobs and, and uh, working hard. And although the economy is on paper doing really well, they haven't had any economic progress in 30 years. And yet they're not arguing against America. They're just saying, we, we've got to get something that works that, that gives us you know, the kind of future that we need. I think that we need to understand that leaders can, they can, reach out to those things which we need at the moment. If, if we think we don't have hope, somebody will give a hope even if it's absolutely not real. Or if somebody, if we need an enemy, if we want to blame things on someone, someone can, can play that card as well. Um, I think that President Trump is just almost gifted at that ability to pick certain themes and use them. And whether you agree with them or not, what we need to do is we as Americans need to look in the mirror and decide what we want to be as Americans. What do we want that to mean for ourselves? What do we want the tenor of our society to be? And when we've done that, we then need to say, what do we want the leaders who represent us to be? How do we want them to act? What do we want them to value? What are the ethics and values that are important to us? And you know, those are sort of basic questions, and you don't have to ask the candidate, you ask yourself. Mm. And when we ask ourselves and each other, then we realize we select the leaders. Yeah. We select them, we deselect them, we support them, or we don't. And so, you know, it's almost independent of President Trump. This is about us. So we shouldn't go home tonight, look at the TV if we don't like him and blame it on him, and we shouldn't you know, look at the TV if we love him and say, yeah, yeah, finally, we had to, we had to decide what we want. Please. General, if you were to pivot. I'm sorry, tell, tell them who you are. Oh, Nathan Rosenberg from Insignium. Um, 
I went to the other trade school in Colorado. <laughs> wow, it's very sad, but <laughs> you can be retrained. We'll see how it turns out next month. Yeah. <laughs> I'm um, talking about football. I yeah, think. okay. That's right. All right. Uh, General, if you were to pivot now, given the experience you've had since you retired, yeah. and the Joint Chiefs and the heads of the Unified Commands were all in the room together, all the four stars, what advice from a business view would you give back to the military? Great yeah. question. I, th I think the military is in need of some big changes. One of the first is the military is a guild-like system. You, to, to get to the top, you must start at the bottom. The good part of that is you create monks who you know, know, know the culture. The bad part is you create monks who know the culture. The f yeah, the first thing I'd do is I would start lateral entry into the military. Wow. And at very senior levels, I would go out into this room and I'd find two, three, or four ladies and gentlemen. I'd say, okay, we'd like you to come in the Army, Navy, maybe the Air Force, you know, they could probably do better than that. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but, but no, and I would bring them in, not as just advisors or specialists, I'd bring them in as colonels and generals, and I'd say, we want three years. And you know what they'd find? They'd find they'd learn to wear a uniform, learn to salute, learn the acronyms, and in three months, they'd be as good as everybody else. And what that would do huh. is breathe fresh air into the military. Huh. It would bring different ideas and whatnot. I would send military officers out for more time out with business for the same reason. So they'd come back saying, you know, these companies do certain things differently. I would also uh, change how we select to Brigadier General. And I'm talking the Officer Corps, but same is true of the NCO Corps. The big selection to Brigadier General is like the keys to the C-suite. They're in the Army, there's about 2,400 people looked at every year, 40 make it. And so it's the incredible eye of the needle. If you get that wrong, you can never fix it because all of the two stars come from the one stars. So that's your chance to get it right. The problem is it's pretty antiquated the way we look. And we look yeah. down. I sat that board twice. Yeah. And what do you do? You look down and say, how many stands are there? We got to promote those guys because I'm excellent. And <laughs> well, I mean, that's the theory. And so what we have to do is change that. We need to say, uh -huh. OK. It's very hard for an iconoclast to get promoted to Brigadier General in the Army, or in any service, because the, the culture doesn't support it. And, and uh, did you, have you shared this radical idea of lateral hires with your active duty uh, friends? I have, but you know, once you're a retired guy, you shouldn't say too much. Yeah, I understand. I didn't, <laughs> you know, didn't want to hear from retired guys when yeah. I was active. And, yeah, right here, please. Uh, General, thank you for being here tonight. My stand, name is Ebony please. Thomas um, with Bank of America. Um, you you talked about two um, leaders with uh, Coco Chanel um, and um, with Robert Lee, uh, Robert Lee, but you also talked about Harriet Tubman as, as a hero, as a leader. And I'm interested to know, as you think about leadership and you here you have a former slave with no education and, and the correlation between leadership and that of education and if at all there is some kind of connectivity to that. Well, you know, we try to educate leadership, but the reality is Harriet Tubman, five foot five, former slave, escaped slave, goes back into slave territory 13 times to rescue other slaves, becomes a tactical leader. Then she becomes this symbolic leader of the movement, not just the abolitionist movement, but the movement to free slaves. I mean, that's completely unpredictable because she's not educated, she's not any of these things, but she's a leader through her actions. Now, she only freed about 80 people herself. That doesn't matter. She became a lever. She became a lever for the African-American population. And too early, she became a lever for females. But the reality is, you know, it's that kind of leadership that doesn't check all the blocks. You know, she didn't have any of the qualities or qualifications to get considered for CEO. But she did pretty darn good. And so that's where these mythologies come out. Um, dinner is literally waiting. I want to ask you one last question, to, to, if you would share with everybody. Since you left the Army, you've been, you have been an advocate for universal uh, uh, um, yeah. national service. National service, thank you. Um, tell everybody why you believe in that, what it means, and why we haven't gotten well, there yet. Thanks for asking that. Um, I think the existential threat to the United States is that degradation of what we think a citizen is. 
and that is we think if we pay our taxes and if we vote every few years that we're doing our thing. And the reality is citizenship is a contract between people to do things, to form a nation, to form a state, whatever. And so citizenship carries these rights, which you have, privileges, you can call them, and it carries responsibilities. But where do you learn the responsibilities? You know, you could say civics class, but that's not very strong. Most of us learn responsibilities as leaders in our companies or in our, somewhere where we experience something, where we have to do something connected to people. And so the first thing you want to do is create this idea of leadership that everybody feels invested. If you live in a housing project in Brooklyn right now, you don't feel that invested in the American dream because it is not anywhere within reach. So what we've got to do is create this idea that everyone has an investment in it. And so the idea that we have is every person does, every young American between 18 and 28 does a year of paid national service. Now, not military. You could do military, but also you could do Teach for America. You could do City of Your America or any number, faith-based, a year paid. It has to be paid so that it's not limited to people whose parents can support them. Right. And then the idea is you work with people not from your zip code. You do things you may not do later in life. Maybe you're working trails, you know, building them in a national park. Maybe you're working in an old folks home. Maybe you're working healthcare. Maybe you're helping teachers in schools. You're doing something that has to be done, deriving satisfaction, but you are also getting that sense of investment in society and fellow Americans. If you do national service right now, because we study this, you vote at three times the rate of your other Americans. Mm. And you have a tendency to be involved. I think the only way to make America the country we want it to be is to go upstream, invest in young people, create the alumni from this so that they will help change society. We don't, you know, things like World War II, you know, united people, but we don't want World War II no. to come along to do that. No. And this is our chance to push for it. Well, um, first of all, Stan, thank you for being here tonight. It's become very popular to say thank you for your service. I want to say to you, thank you for your continued service to your country. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.